From focus to productivity, we can train our brains to perform better, but our modern day work culture isn't helping. Cognitive neuroscientist Sahar Youssef is using brain science to create higher performers without all the burnout. Yusef is a cognitive neuroscientist and lecturer at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. She's founder of Becoming Superhuman, a consulting firm to train professionals how to work better with less stress by understanding how the human brain works. We have the one brain. So my big push that I would say fundamentally seeing the brain as being measurable, it's not a mystery. It's not a mystery box. We have a certain amount of capacity so my goal for every human is to say, accept this capacity, let's use it. Raise your hands again. How many cell phones do we have out on the table? You're literally making the entire room dumber. Yousef's Becoming Superhuman program aims to help participants improve their focus, memory, and overall cognitive performance. Uh, you have a lab trying to create all these superhumans. Uh, there are strategies involved. Everyone watching this wants to be one. So uh, what would you tell folks who are interested in, you know, performing at a higher level? I would say we start with the basics first before getting into the advanced topics. The foundation of becoming superhuman is truly accepting and embracing, even leveraging the ways in which we're actually human. That's the real science of becoming superhuman. And I will say sup the word superhuman, I know can ruffle some feathers. I've definitely been all around the world and people will say, oh, enough of the superhuman stuff. Like we're all burned out. We're tired. We're exhausted. We're not machines. And it's like, no, no, no that's actually the point. The point of becoming superhuman is for us to take a step back, recognize that we're not in fact machines. We're biological entities. We're big bags of blood, guts, and chemicals. And we do operate a certain way. There are fundamental laws of biology that dictate how our brains and our bodies work best, how this entire system best works. And we shouldn't believe or not believe. It's not a fad. It's not whatever, you know, new study has come out. These are fundamental laws of how we actually operate for a millennia as a human species. You did mention the brain. It's an important element of what do we need to know about the brain? Oh, so many things. <laughs> but no, the fundamentals, I would say. I think the fundamentals about the brain that are a bit lost, I will say, that have slowly become lost in our generation, is that we are, in fact, focus machines. We are monotasking machines. This whole concept of multitasking and being able to keep track of a cell phone, a watch, a smartwatch that's buzzing you, and all of these different things. I see folks working. Uh, in office spaces, and they've got a primary task. Maybe you do engineering work, so you have the terminal open in your coding. But then off to the side, they have email open, messages open, they, the phone is right here. And what are we focusing on? The World Health Organization defines burnout as chronic workplace stress that shows up as low energy, negative feelings, and a reduced ability to perform our jobs. In Japanese, there is even a term for death from overwork, karochi. Let me ask about burnout, because it's a serious problem. Can you describe what it is and how do you reverse it, or can you reverse it? Absolutely. So although burnout, people talk about it a lot, and I think it's become, unfortunately, too casual of a word. Folks are saying like, oh, I had a crazy week. I'm totally burned out. It's like, oh. burnout is a very, very serious clinical syndrome. It's marked by changes in the brain, changes in the body with our adrenals, our hormonal systems. It's a very serious thing to have happen to a human being, and it can take months to reverse. And unfortunately, the only thing that we know of that can in fact reverse it is time off. You need to actually have very intentional rest for a very, very long period of time. Now, I'm more interested in preventing it. And I think most people are, I hope as well. Let's prevent us from even getting to that state of burnout. And I will say the easiest way to do that is to integrate into every day, every week, and every month. We call this the 3M framework. 3M, macro, meso, and micro breaks. 
that every human ought to be taking to actually prevent burnout from taking place, even if you have a very stressful job in life. Macro breaks, half day to a full day, once a month, completely off. It's the biggest break. Mm -hmm. Meso breaks, every week, couple of hours, two to four hours, completely off. Every day, micro break, for a matter of minutes, taking some time completely off. Now you're looking at me, Mike, like I'm crazy. You're like, no. for a matter of minutes, I take a shower, right? Like, doesn't that count? But what you're saying is take care of yourself, which we don't yeah. do a very good job of, right? Yeah, you have to. If you really think about performance and productivity, right? You wanna treat yourself like a very fancy luxury car. You gotta maintenance the thing, right? And you can't just keep driving a machine and not think that it's going to wear down over time. So if you wanna make sure that your brain and body is longevity and it's not gonna burn out, you have to integrate actual care. Over the decades, attention spans have decreased according to research from the University of California, Irvine. Studies found people spend an average of 47 seconds focusing on a screen before their attention moves on to something else. I was doing a freelance job many years ago. I was the on-camera talent. There's a whole crew, cameras everywhere. In the end, the guy screams, the perfect cut. And everybody grabbed their cell phone and started looking at it. And, and I said, uh, you know, looking at everyone, I, I wonder, you know, do we own the technology or does the technology own us? Absolutely. I love the way you phrase that. Do I own this device or does the device own me? And there's been, and it's not a shift. And I don't like to demonize, you know, industries or companies or anything like that. It's not about that. Because it's to me, my, this is my humble opinion. I think that's like getting mad at a candy company. They're doing their job. They're making delicious chocolate or candy. They're doing their job. It's my job to know what I'm buying and to moderate. We need to customize the device. We need to actually go in and update the settings so that it's working for us, right? If it's not working for you to be surrounded by candy all of the time with no restrictions, that's like, hey, me too. <laughs> so you make adjustments. You say, okay, I'm not going to have it all of the time everywhere. So that's what I would say. It's like, yeah, pushing of updating our environment so that it's working for us a little bit more. And one of the other things you talk about, which I think is really interesting, is this concept of like, well, I can do this really small task and such a success, whereas the more important task I may put off. Can you talk a little bit about that? And why is it we're kind of programmed to do that? And how do we unravel that and make ourselves more productive? That's a great question. So I'm going to use the P word procrastination. Completely natural. The natural human instinct of putting off big, scary, many times important, right? And impactful work and tasks and projects. And instead, in lieu of that, we're attracted to the little things. Let me just, ooh, let me just, it'll take me one second to, let me organize this first. This is a completely natural human instinct. And we see this internationally. We see this everywhere around the world. Why is it a natural human instinct? Well, because it actually serves us for survival. If you think about it, for most of our lives on this earth, human beings have been in a position of needing to be creative and survive. We're not in a position of thinking super long-term. Most humans, for most of our existence throughout evolution, it was just about stay alive today, find some food, find shelter, do not die. Go to bed, do the same thing again, over and over and over. One day is a success and you move on to the next. That means we are naturally, naturally, again, remember we're accepting biology. I am a human, I am not a machine. And these are the ways in which we all tend to work. Accepting that and saying, hmm, it is natural for a human to be short-term minded. Now it's not just about short-term mindedness, it's actually about dopamine and how dopamine works in the human brain. Now, dopamine is the brain's primary motivation-related neuromodulator. It's one of many neuromodulators in the human brain, but I think a very important one as it relates to, yes, motivation, but also prioritizing important work versus less important work, right? Now, the way dopamine works in the human brain is that if you have enough of it, if you have enough of it, it'll get you to action. It'll get you out of your seat and say, okay, I'm going to go do this thing, right? If you have less of it, then it will not move you to action. 
we are all going to naturally be gravitating towards anything that's going to give us a sense of progress or satisfaction or completion as quickly as possible. Because it's going to give us the promise of reward. So evolutionarily, in terms of our work, in terms of our productivity, most humans are going to naturally gravitate towards email, messages, texts, things that are fast and quick. Because it gives us these fast little hits of, I did this. Good. I did this next thing. Awesome. Yes. You're moving through. The problem is that the big stuff is usually the stuff that makes a big difference. Our cell phones are everything. Yusuf and co-founder Lucas Miller give talks and workshops to armed professionals with their science-based methods. Let's take a step back together. If you've got every single thing that you care about in your entire life wrapped up in this rectangle, especially for those who are parents or caretakers, something happens with your kids and you're not next to them, this is where you're going to hear about it. This means so much to you. So if it's visible, you will absolutely have what are called cognitive decrements. We all are kind of made up the same way. Everything you've just described is what everybody does that. Yeah. So how did you reverse it? How did you figure this out and say, okay, I'm not going to be that person. I'm going to be this person. Well, you, you just got to do it. You, you practice like anything else. Um, I used to work with a lot of athletes and I would, you know, ask them similar questions. And we'd say like, oh my gosh, wow, that's a lot of running. How did you even start? And it's like, well, you start by practicing. You just do it one time, another time, another time, and it starts to become automatic. And that's what I would say is that um, truly I struggled with procrastination myself. So I had to hack it for myself in order to continue studying it and helping other people. And now I will say it's just kind of how I operate. I wake up every single morning. I make myself my, you know, my tea. I get my coffee, whatever. And then I have a whiteboard. I have it like I have whiteboards everywhere in my house, but I have one in my living room, I have one in my kitchen. But I whichever one I'm choose for that day, I go up to that whiteboard and I kind of ask myself, okay, and I sometimes I open up my computer, I look at my to-do list, I have all my papers around, and I go, okay, how much time do I have today outside of meetings and calls? That is my anchor. That's all I look at. I don't look at everything else. New emails come in, unless it's an emergency, I'm not paying attention. This is what I need to get done. One of the holdovers of the pandemic is people's ability to work from home. About one third of workers who can work from home do so all of the time, according to a 2023 Pew Research Center survey. This is up from 7% before the pandemic. So we can people are still working from home. So what are some advice, tips that you give to folks who are still working at home because of, you know, they haven't transitioned back? They may never. The human brain works in what are called cognitive associations. So we have neural networks in the brain that are connected, connecting that dispersed areas in the brain to one another, right? And what ends up happening is we begin to associate an object, a sound, a sight, a smell, a sense of touch to something. Two things become slowly over time associated together. When one is fired, we're talking neurologically, becomes electrically activated in the brain, the other one starts to automatically, over time, become electrically activated. So now, let's go to the pandemic. People are in their houses, a lot of young people, small. It's I have one couch. I don't have 10 couches. I don't have the opportunity to say, this is my work couch. This is my relax couch. That's my TV couch. No, you have one couch. And then all of a sudden, you're having a stressful conversation with your manager. You get a call, all of the, you're getting a new deadline. It's a project. It's a bunch of stuff you didn't anticipate. All of a sudden, your couch is slowly starting to become associated with work. Now, guess what? It's the end of the day, work is over. You close your laptop, you're still sitting in the same place. And now you wanna relax. Your brain has no idea what's going on. It's it literally, it would say to you like, Mike, man, pick a lane. What is this, what is this associated with? So the idea behind sort of the pandemic best practices, but remote work, I will say best practices is choose a safe place in your house that is just for work. That's just your work area. If you can manage it, even if it's a small corner, you need to have some sort of ritual. So it sends the signal to the human brain. Something is different. And then at the end of the day, I want my house back. I want my couch back. I want my bedroom back. So then you need to do something else to undo it. Maybe you go into home clothes. 
You switch something else out. You play a song. You can do music, musical associations. You could have a song that you play at the beginning of the workday and a song that you play at the end of the workday. Always the same. You can't change it. This is the, and then you go, oh, I know what to do. And then it's the end of the workday and it's like, ah, okay, we're done. Well, thank you for making this thing happen today. It was a delight (laughs) talking to you. Thanks so much. Yeah, of course. This was absolutely delightful.